So you're going to have to bear with me today because I've had a lot of time up my hands. Where am I going? Where am I going? Do, 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 do. Yes, your Yahoo. What does that mean? Yes, your Yahoo. What? Means the salvation of the Lord. Who's Yes, your Yahoo? What? No. Yeah. Isaiah. Mentions salvation more times than all the prophets put together. That's why his name is salvation. The Spirit of the Lord, Adonai, Elohim, is upon me. Because Adonai has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the broken hide. Uh, this has been uh, quite heavy on me because I'm seeing it a lot. I'm seeing people broken hearted and struggling around me, and it hurts and uh, it makes me want to fight. I don't uh, when I get pushed in a corner, I come out swinging to proclaim liberty to the captives and to opening. The prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of Adonai's favour and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all who mourn. Amen. Drawn to that scripture this week, like you wouldn't believe. Yeshayahu, the salvation of the Lord, very messianic, very prophetic scripture now. It's one of 333 prophetic scriptures in the Old Testament that proclaim Messiah. 333. What's that? Divine perfection. Three is divine. Three is God's number. Divine. Divine perfection. Y'all have got, if you're new, y'all have got a, a little, what do you call them, the best? The Brian Carl on a clipboard. Um, there's a lot of scripture today. Please use those scriptures. Please take your notes, take them away and study them. That's a Bible study for you right there. It's a bit of discipleship for you right there. Get into the word, dig in. See what you find. You're not going to find anything unless you dig. Well, I'm telling you, there's gold in them there hills. Absolutely. Where, where do you see that scripture in the New Testament? Yeah, where's that? Where is it? Luke. Come on, Beth's getting all the bonus points here. <laughs> Come on! So I got drawn to that and I just wanted to um, open that up and explore it some, teach it, opening the scripture, exposing the scripture and its meaning. Well, how, was that? how was that swing? Cool? Everybody in? Don't, if you want to go make a brew, go make a brew, make sure, knock yourself out, chill out, make yourself at home, okay? What? Absolutely. Family, right? So Luke chapter 4. Yeshua's been fasting and praying. That's been laid heavy on me because we're going to do it tomorrow. He's been in the wilderness. And the enemy's come at him, trying to tempt him, trying to tempt him. I hasten to add and enforce. Depends on how you read it, but I, I read it like 
Yeshua beat the snot out of him. That's how I read it. And came away victorious. Why? To start his ministry. That's why. And he give him, what did he give him? Give him the sword, didn't he? Deuteronomy. Really kicked the snot out of him. And he's come back to start his ministry now at his prime, almost 30. Why is he almost 30? What time of year is it? Who is he? Is he, is he the shofar of the Lord? Maybe he started his ministry on Yom Teruah. And he said, Children, come home. Time to repent. Kingdom of God's here. Yeah? Why is he almost 30? Because it's nearly tabernacles. I can show you in your Bible he was born at tabernacles. I can prove it to you. Oh, it's not in the Bible, Annie. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Kingdom of God is at hand. Time to get cleaned up, kids. Get your sin and your guilt washed away. I've come to tabernacle amongst you. Can you see it in the face? Of course you can. So he's gone home to the Gileel in the power of the Spirit. So this is where the story starts. Yeshua returned to the Galil in the power of the Spirit. Reports about him spread throughout the countryside. He taught in the synagogues. Everybody respected him. Now he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up on Shabbat. He went to the synagogue as usual. He stood up to read and he was given the scroll of the prophet Yeshayahu. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of Adonai is upon me. Therefore he has anointed me to announce the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the imprisoned and renewed sight for the blind, to release those who have been crushed, to proclaim a year of favour of Adonai. After closing the scroll and returning Returning the scroll to the Shamash. Shamash is a deacon or an attendant. He sat down and the eyes of everybody in the synagogue were fixed on him. He started to speak to them. Today, as you've heard it, this passage of the Tanakh was fulfilled. Everyone was speaking well of him and marveling that such appealing words were coming from his mouth. They were even asking, can, can this be Joseph's son? Then Yeshua said to them, no doubt you'll quote me this, this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. We've heard about all these things. They've been going on over in Kafanachum. Now do them here in your hometown. Yes, I tell you, no prophet is accepting in his, home, his hometown. Kafanachum, what's that? Capernaum. What does it mean? Yeah, what does Nachum mean? <laughs> Kafar. Kafar is village. Nachum is comfort. Wouldn't the comforter live in the village of comfort? So we're going to break it down a little bit. Expose it. Because there's a way, there's a way to study, right? Scripture has to prove Scripture. We have to decipher whether, see people will say you've got to take all, all Scripture literal. No, you don't. You've got to decipher, you've got to discern what's literal and what's not. Because you've got to take into account that there's metaphor, there's mixed metaphor, there's simile, there's hyperbole, there's symbolism. You have to see these things, and these things have to have a thread right that run right through the Bible. You have to read in context. 
most important of all. You've got to reconcile all apparent discrepancies. And I say apparent because they are. Just because you've not got it figured out yet doesn't mean it's not figured out, does it? There's 969 apparent discrepancies through 31,102 verses of your Bible. And they have all been reconciled. And then there's the law of double reference in prophecy. Five laws you've got to you've got to you've got to sit on if you want to read your Bible and interpret it correctly. Luke four thirteen fourteen. When the adversary had ended ended all his testings, he led him alone until an opportune time. Yeshua returned to the Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and reports about him thread, spread through the countryside. An opportune time. When would you say that was going to be? He's going to try and he's going to wait until Yeshua is vulnerable. The enemy will always attack when he thinks you're, you're running on empty. You read in your Bible about um, Amalek. Amalek were, um, they were known for attacking the rear of the tribe. Who did they keep at the rear? Women and children, the vulnerable, the old. So what does that make them? Makes them cowards, bullies. And the enemy will always try and hit you at the weak point. Everybody's got a different weak point. So you've got to guard yourself, don't you? Guard yourself at your weakest point. That makes sense, doesn't it? Always on guard. Yeshua goes back to the Gilead. He's got that using, using the spirit in the power. Spirit and power go together like peas and carrots. No spirit, no power. All you've got really then is just a form of religion, isn't it? No spirit, no power, period. You can have all the knowledge you want. I have no power because there's no spirit. So what's that telling us? It's telling us it's not the letter of the law. It's the spirit of it. Did he not say we're looking for worshippers in spirit and in truth? Got to have both. Meaning you've got to have the right heart with the right information. And now he's starting to get well known now. He taught in the synagogues. Everybody respected him. There's no Gentiles involved here. If the Gentile, the proselytes to Judaism. Gentiles were just Pagans. So there's no Gentiles going to synagogue as Gentiles. He's highly respected as a Jewish rabbi. You just can't go and teach in a synagogue. Sit in the seat of Moses. There was always a seat. You know, Any time they set up, there was a seat Literally a seat. That was the seat of them, of Moses. Seat of the teacher. You couldn't do that unless you was absolutely bona fide, legitimate and respected. Respected to render or esteem. Make glorious. To honour, to magnify. Doxadzo. We get our English word doxology from that Greek word. The words of his, of his glory. It's an oral expression of praise and glorification. Doxology. 
So he was praised, he was honoured and rendered excellent. But doxology is, is more a, a doing word. It's more, it's more than what he's saying. It's what you were doing. And everybody heard, when he got, when he got baptised, everybody heard that voice going, this is my son. That's called a back call. B-A-T-K-O-L, back call. Back call from heaven, the voice of heaven. That got around. It was a small community. Everybody knew everybody else. At least 7,900 7, square miles. You could probably wall-to-wall -wall carpet it from carpet call in a couple of days. Like you said, he's that small. Everybody knew everybody else. This is my son. So he goes to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up on Shabbat. He went to synagogue, guess what? As usual. Nazareth was where he lived most of his life, small town. Now there's nowhere he'll find in the Tanakh that says Messiah will come from Nazareth. But Isaiah, Isaiah says and calls him a branch or a shoot, a Nazareth, Nazareth, a shoot town, a Netzir, Netzir. Not be careful, not a Nazarite. He wasn't a Nazarite. A Nazarite would not eat or drink from the grape. He would not cut his hair. He would not go near the dead. Yeshua drank wine, didn't he? Did he have long hair? Well, we always depict him like he's long blonde hair, don't he? Like six foot four and blonde haired and blue eyed like he's Norwegian. But he wasn't. Thank you, Michelangelo. It was an abomination for a man to have long hair. So why, why would he have long hair? If he had long hair, he'd be under a vow, definitely. He, he was under a vow in your Bible. He was a Nazarite in your Bible. Samson was a Nazarite. Who else? Hmm? What? John. He resurrected the dead, didn't he? He went to Naim, remember? The widow's son. Wake up, son. Touch the dead. Another eye wouldn't do that. There was only two, you only, you only find a couple, you find Samson and, and John that were under a lifelong Nazarite vow. Normally it was, it could be a month or it could be a hundred days or whatever. He was a Nazarene. A shoot will come forth from Jesse, a Natsi. In the Hebrew, a Natsi will come forth from Jesse, David's father was what Isaiah wrote some 750 years before. So he goes to Nazareth and he goes to Shabbat. He goes, he goes to synagogue on Shabbat as usual. That was his custom. You can dance around it all you want. You can have all the theology and the denominationalism you want. But Shabbat never changed. Never changed. Show me in your Bible where it changed. Show me where Yeshua said. Well, then, like, did he did he get to the Mount of Olives when he was going to ascend and shout down to Peter, Hey, Pete, don't worry about Shabbat no more. Did he? That didn't happen. Did it? Shabbat, Shabbat. 
You can worship every day. Yes, you can. But you can't have Shabbat every day. No, you can't have it on any day you want, either. Where are you getting that from? We told you that, chapter and verse. Oh, Annie, you're being legalistic by observing the Shabbat on Saturday. Why aren't you being legalistic observing it on a Sunday then? Certainly no more legalistic. And we're, if anything, we're on the money because we're doing what God's word says, aren't we? We're being more obedient. Obedience isn't legalism. It is not. Legalism isn't what you do. It's the reason why you do it. So if all authority was given to Yeshua, is all authority given to Yeshua? Do we all agree with that? Fundamental. And survey says... Shabbat wasn't changed. He says it's made, do you know what? It's, it's like the feast, it's a feast, isn't it? So we say, if you observe the feast of the Lord, because they're his, because he says in Leviticus 23, these are my feasts, mine. They belong to him. They don't belong to Jewish people. They don't belong to us. They belong to him. There's no way you'll find in scripture it says, just do these things till Messiah comes. You're not going to find that neither. That's not there. So everybody does the feast. Everybody on a Shabbat before he comes. Everybody does the feast and on a Shabbat while he's here. And everybody's going to do it again when he comes back. Because I'm telling you now, if, you, if you're not looking for a Jewish Messiah, you're going to miss him. So where's the disconnect? Why don't we do it now? I told you we we're going to get it. I'm like, give me a week off and watch it. Traditions of man. Did he like the traditions of man? Or did he barrel against them? You'll always get some muppet who'll say, oh, well, Jesus spoke about money more than anything else. No, he didn't. Check your scriptures. There's not that much. He didn't speak that much. He did. Every time, get a bit narky about people following the traditions of man before his word. And to say you change it, it goes against the word of God. It goes, goes against his word. It's the traditions of man. Friday, Fridays, Fridays are different. Everything's geared towards sundown. Because you're preparing to usher in the king into your heart, into your home. On Shabbat. It's a special meal. It's different. We light candles that day. We say prayers. To the light of the world. You light a candle for who? The light of the world, right? We pray. Shabbat prayers. It's supposed to be different. It's supposed to be set apart. And we're setting ourselves apart for the one who is totally set apart. That's the whole deal. And then, that's your Friday evening. So they, it makes sense to corporately come and worship today, doesn't it? 
called in Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 24, 25, to spur each other on to love and good deeds, not neglecting our own congregational meetings. Oh, I can worship at home. I watch Rabbi Greg. I watch Arnie. I can sit there in my PJs, drinking my coffee. You're neglecting your own people who need you and you need them. Because this is family and we're supposed to love one another. That causes explosions all over the heavenlies, doesn't it? When we're loving one another and we're helping one another. Do we rub one another up each sometimes? Yeah, absolutely. But maybe you need something rubbing off. Maybe you need something filing down. We're supposed to walk in forgiveness, aren't we? We're not supposed to walk in offence. Why are you getting offended? Why be offended? Let it go. That, and it just phew, sets you free, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Study to show yourself approved. Don't take Pastor Dave's word for it. Got to separate yourself. I think the story was still going to church on a Sunday. Nothing to stop that. But it makes more sense to do what God says. Do it right. One day. On the right day. You can go to church on a Sunday. You can go to Wednesday, whenever. But Shabbat. It's Shabbat. Work is to be done on six days, but the seventh day is a Shabbat of complete rest, a holy convocation. What is holy convocation? With, I don't know, that's your dictionary biblical definition of holy convocation. It's a set apart meeting, congregational, corporate, with him. It's the same deal as the other feasts. Not do what you want. Not do till Messiah comes. Not for ju just Jewish people. It's for Adonai. It never changed. So we spend time with the Lord. We spend time with family. We spend time with the Mishpocha. When Shabbat fades, everything changes again. It's sad. But then you wake up and, and then I'm thinking, I'm thinking about next week. I start working on next week in the morning. That's what we do. All our week's geared to this. Now across denominational lines, across the board from Catholic to charismatic, everybody would agree that we are to do what Yeshua did. Is that fair? The Bible says he did this as usual. Went to synagogue on Shabbat as usual. Etho in the Greek to practice, to be accustomed to use, to get used to. Where we get ethos from. The character, the fundamental values of a person, the culture or movement, something which produces inherent quality of work. A high moral impression. It's noble, it's dignified and universal and quite deliberate. That's ethos. So we quite deliberately practice this for us to follow.
He did this as usual. What else did he do as usual? Luke twenty two thirty nine. On leaving, Yeshua went as usual to the Mount of Olives. And the Talmudin, his student, followed him. Why did he go to the Mount of Olives? He pulled away to get with his daddy and get juiced up again because he'll have poured out. You pour out, you get filled up. You pour out, you get filled. He had the spirit without measure, didn't he? But he had to retreat and pray. Mark 10.1, Yeshua left that place and went into the regions of Judah and the territory beyond the Jordan. Again, crowds gathered around him. And again, as usual, he taught them. So here's what Yeshua did. He went to synagogue on Shabbat. He got with his father every day. And he taught people his word. So this is how we should be now. Get with your heavenly father every day. Make sure your customs to come to Shabbat and shine your light and teach and disciple somebody. Go fish. Go catch them and then you clean them. People need discipleship. People need the word. There's a famine. There's a famine for the word now. He was given the scroll of the prophet Yeshiahu. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it's written, the spirit of anoy had annoyed upon me. Therefore, he's annoyed me to announce good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the imprisoned and renew sight for the blind to release those who have been crushed. Poor. Jump in the gun. He's just, um, we've been given this scroll. The salvation of the Lord. Don't, don't, you know, don't miss that. Isaiah, as we know him. But it could have been the scroll of any number of their prophets, couldn't it? But it just happened to be that scroll that day. Coinky dink. It's just when he started his ministry, he's anointed and he's appointed. And the first time he walks in, they just happened to give him this scroll. got to be a coincidence right he unrolls it and he reads it it's for the poor dochas meaning someone who's reduced to beggary begging lowly and afflicted it's not always a bad place to be It's not always a bad thing to be lowly and afflicted. Why? Because then you're dependent. And I'm reason I'm I'm getting it more and more. The older I'm getting, just how dependent I am on him for everything. And I'm okay with that. I'm good with that. He takes his hand off you. You're done, aren't you? Lowly, afflicted, worthless. We feel worthless a lot of the time. But we're anything but. He came so we'd know the cost of sin. And it's very, very costly. It's very damaging, it's very destructive. And he came to say... Don't do that anymore. And he came because we've got great, and I mean great, redemptive value to him. Don't miss that either. 
He loves you that much. Told you before, we're, we're pearls. We're the pearls in his hand. Great, great value. That's why he came and he died in our place. That makes you anything but worthless. That's the message for the poor, the imprisoned, those in bondage, those oppressed, mentally, spiritually, as well as physically. Came to release you, but you've got to believe it. You've got to walk in it. You've got to be baptised, baptismo, <coughs> absolutely immersed in him. The blind, physically, yes, but more the blind mind, a mind that doesn't understand, doesn't see who God is until God re re chooses to reveal himself. God finds you, you don't find him. And when he finds you, he fills that God-shaped hole in you because everybody's got one. We've all got that hole that needs him. And now you see your mind, it's open to his spirit and your heart gets operated on and then you become new. You become born again. Some don't even remember what that experience was like. Have you been born again? Is the next question. Because if you don't, maybe you're not. You can sit in church all your life. Have you repented? Truly repented? Truly made teshuva and turned? And been immersed in him? For the forgiveness of your sins? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Acts 2.38 Repent for the forgiveness of your sins. Be immersed in the name of Yeshua for the forgiveness of those sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. You should remember that because there should have been some sort of change and it's huge. It's a marked difference things you've never done before you go and do, places you'd never go before you'd go. People you wouldn't, you wouldn't touch with a barge pole. Now you love them. It's weird. It's a strange thing, right? Born again. People who are crushed, broken in pieces. Three, oh, broken in pieces. What happens with this walk is when you join the gang, you can literally get smashed to pieces. Not by the enemy. Not by the enemy, by the Lion of Judah. He'll come at you like a storm. And he will break you down until there's nothing left of you. And all you've got is him as your foundation. And then he puts you back together again. Better than you could ever be. He literally takes you from the scrap heap. And he puts you on the showroom floor. Can, uh, does anybody get that? Has anybody had that experience? Come on, smile at me. It's like looking at a painting. Come on, wake up! Wake up! Come on, talk to me. We like that. <laughs> me, my head on. He'll put you back together.
They don't really tell you that now, do they, in church? Because it's tough, it's a tough thing. It doesn't put bums on seats, but it's true. All you really want to hear is, well, I'm God's favourite. I've got my picture on his fridge. And everything's going to be kittens and rainbows. So what happens when it gets rough? And you've not been zapped out on a magic carpet ride. Oh, nothing bad's going to happen to you. We're all going to... That won't cut the mustard, will it? When it goes south. And then guess who's going to get the blame? Because we all take the credit when everything goes well, but we all blame God when it goes wrong. And Yeshua said, the love of the many will grow cold. Brethren. Talking about the brethren, not the world. Got to guard against that, don't we? To proclaim a year of favour of Adonai. Yeshua ends the reading there. Well, that wasn't the end of the passage, was it? To proclaim the year of favour of Adonai and the day of vengeance of our God. Why didn't Yeshua carry on and say the day of vengeance? Well, the day of vengeance is when he comes up, he comes a second time. But at this point, right here, right now, he's focused on his first advent. You, you don't want to be in the day of vengeance. You would want to avoid that one. You need to focus on his first advent, his year of favour. Get that right. Stay clothed in the righteousness of Messiah. But notice how good he is. The year of favour and a day of vengeance. Did you ever think about that? It's not literal. This isn't literal. His favour... Well, it's lasted 2,000 years so far. But he will take vengeance one day, and he will judge rightly. So your sins, up until you shut your eyes, or he comes, whichever comes first, right now they're written in pencil, Right? When you shut your eyes, it becomes permanent marker. What sets us apart is all we have to do is accept his sacrifice. It's a free gift. The Holy One of God, Yeshua the Messiah. You call upon the name of the Lord. If you accept that he died, he was buried, he was rose again for the forgiveness of your sins, you will be saved. So turn, make Teshuva, repent, be immersed in him. What have we got to lose? Get immersed in him. You receive the Holy Spirit. Don't wait till tomorrow. Why, why are you going to wait? Do it today. You've got nothing to lose. You've got everything to gain. Everything to gain. Oh, but I'm a good person. But your sins don't cut you to the heart, do they? Because your heart's hard. You've got to guard against your heart getting hardened. You get one bath, well, there's many, 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 many washings. You've got to keep on repenting. Keep that heart soft. Keep it from going hard. Repentance breaks up the fallow ground, then the living water comes in and waters that fallow ground, and then what do you get? The fruit, right? Do 
After, scro- after closing the scroll and returning it to the Shamash, he sat down and his eyes of everybody in the synagogue were fixed on him. He started to speak of him. Today, as you've heard it, this passage in the tonight was fulfilled. Everyone was speaking well of him, marveling that such appealing words were coming from his mouth. You're even asking, can this be Joseph's boy? All eyes fixed on him. Like there was just something about him. Everywhere he went, people either loved him to bits and they'd give their life for him. Or they just wanted him dead. There was no sitting on the fence with Yeshua, no grey area. Everybody's quiet, everybody's eyes are locked on. What's he going to say? Buckle up for this one. This is the shortest sermon ever. He looks up and he says, Today, as you've heard it, this passage is fulfilled. Fulfilled. Play rattle. Play rattle. To accomplish. To fully teach. It doesn't mean, well, I've come, I'm going to do it all so you don't have to. Who's, who's heard that teaching? Absolute for character, crazy teaching. All you've got to do to be saved is a roll call. Pack your bag and wait for the magic carpet ride. You wonder why there's a famine. You wonder why people are switched off. Israel are going to go through all that bad stuff. That's what they teach, isn't it? And these people are pretty smart who teach it. PhDs coming out of their ears, you all can pile it higher and deeper if you want, because that's bad teaching. It's nonsense. I'm sorry, but it's nonsense. It's not eschatological. Magic carpet rides were never taught by Yeshua. They were never taught by any of the apostles. Oh, but scripture says this, scripture says that. I'm telling you now, you're twisting scripture to shoehorn it into your theology. And he fulfilled it so we don't have to. Well, so he didn't commit adultery, so now we can. Is that right? How's that work? He didn't steal, so we can. He took care of the poor, the widow, the orphan, so we don't have to? Really? Come on. Come on. Ah, we're not saved by obeying the law. No, that's right. That's absolutely right. He's saved by grace, so no one can boast. He made holy, though, by obeying his word. You've got responsibilities. You're in the Commonwealth of Israel now. Can't break the law here, can you? In the Commonwealth of Australia, you get the benefit of living on the Indian Ocean now, don't you? What happens if you break a law? You've got responsibilities. The same is true of the Commonwealth of Israel supposed to act a certain way how we're supposed to act how we're supposed to imitate you sure so it's bad teaching isn't it it's just bad teaching we sit there and everybody just buy into it oh that's okay then I'm supposed to do what he did if we follow him, shepherds led from the front in Israel. You follow the leader. The sheep follow the shepherd. 
We believe us in the way. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. We're supposed to live the way he lived. Will we fall short? Yes, you will. No, no two ways about it. And it's a process. What are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do when you fall short? It's not a trick question. What are you supposed to do? Turn. Repent. Sorry, Lord. How righteous you are depends on how quick you turn. How close do you want to be? We're supposed to imitate him as much as we can. Everybody's marvelling about him. Because he's had this anointing of the Holy Spirit and it's without measure. It's without measure. He's poured it out and gets filled up again. He was filled to the full. And he's fulfilling the scriptures about who he was. And when he spoke, he had such an anointing and authority. It's going to cut you straight to the heart. And you can't sit on the fence. You've got to choose. Because what he told you was the truth. Truth does offend. What you do with that offence decides which way you're going, doesn't it? At this point, his words are appealing. They're marvellous. It did change when he started saying things like, deny yourself, pick up your cross. But he never lied to you and he told you up front, that's the gospel of the kingdom. And it's part of the gig. You don't just want to get your ears tickled and get told illusions, do you? I could do. I could. I could tell you all sorts of crap, and we'd probably fill this place. But what's what's what good's that going to do? Why they wanted in Isaiah's day, Jeremiah's day? Don't tell us the truth. Tell us something good. Like it's the gospel of Shaka Khan all of a sudden. It's no. Tell me something good, Annie. No. That's not preparing you for when it goes south, and it will go south. We've got to teach the grace of God, but we've got to teach you the truth. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. And you've got to operate in that through your trials as a believer, and then your God gets glorified in it. Because that's what it's all about. Can this be Joseph's son? Let's put him on the back foot now. It was a one-line message that packed such a powerful punch. Knocked him sideways. And rocked him. Because they felt he had power and authority. The power and authority of seeing Almighty God in your midst. And then there's this realisation of, hang on a minute, this is Joe's boy. He's just, he's just a carpenter's son. Small town, everybody knew one another. What did Nathaniel say in John? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Didn't he? Something did. And they felt the power of it and started to think, oh, hang on a minute, what's going on? This is, this is Yeshua. No way, no way he's the Messiah. No way. And he knew what they were thinking. So he says to them, no doubt you'll quote this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. We've heard all about things that have been going on over in Chafranachum. Now do the here in your hometown. Yes, I'll tell you, no prophet's accepted in his own hometown. Ain't that the truth?
Doctor, cure yourself. It's an ancient Hebrew idiomatic proverb. You're not going to find it in Proverbs. Doctor, cure yourself. He's, he's really mocking them. What they said it to him when he was on the cross. Didn't they? People stood watching. The rulers sneered at him. He saved others. So if he really is the Messiah, the one chosen by God, Doctor, cure yourself. Mocking him, not understanding that he has to be one Messiah with two Advents, not two Messiahs in one, the suffering servant and the conquering king in one Advent, two Advents. He was Yeshua, Ben Yosef, the suffering servant, lowly, humble, gentle on a donkey. When he comes back, he's Yeshua Ben David. And he's coming back for a fight. And he's going to be the conquering king. Not on a donkey this time, on a big white war horse. With fire in his eyes. And he's coming back to rule and reign for a millennium on earth as it is in heaven. Make no mistake. No crown of thorns this time. Got a crown of many diadems. King of kings. That mean, that's what that means. You're seeing a 3,000 year old prophecy from the Psalm, Psalm 22. All who see me jeer at me. They sneer and they shake their heads. He committed himself to Adonai, so let him rescue himself. Let him set him free. If you take such delight in him. 3,000 years old. You're sure on the cross. How can that be? How could David see that? Same thing. Horrible. We can identify with it on some level. Not, not to the extent you sure went through, but we all get mocked in our walk. If you're a real deal believer, you'll take a kick in from lukewarm believers. Definitely more than you'll take a kick in off the world. I've got, I've got worldly friends and they'll, they'll absolutely not agree with what I believe in, but they'll respect it. They'll respect it. Because you're walking it out. But it's lukewarm believers who will always try and put you under a microscope. And you can do a thousand things right, you do one thing wrong, and it's like, I see, I told you. Told you. I knew it. Like, like they've been baptized in lemon juice or something. Mocking. We're the only ones who shoot our own wounded, aren't we? It's got to stop. It's got to stop. Matthew 11. Yeshua finished instructing the twelve. And he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns nearby. Meanwhile, Yochanan the Immerser who had been put in prison, heard that Messiah had been doing, or what he'd been doing, I'm sorry, and he sent a message to him through his, through his disciples asking, are you the one who is to come, or should we look for someone else? Yeshua answered, go and tell John what you're hearing and seeing. The blind are seeing again. The lame are walking. People with leprosy, Zacharet, are being cleansed, the deaf are hearing, the dead are being raised, the good news is being told to the poor. 
He had to fulfill all those things to be Messiah. How blessed is anyone not offended by me? So he's sending his, his boys out. He's finished instructing them now, and now he's sending them out. Now it's about spreading the word. That's what discipleship is. It's all about passing on the anointing. Spreading the word. It's about coming, getting juiced up, and then going out and shining your light. Having that spirit and that light burst out of you. And pour it out on somebody else who hasn't got it. That's what we're called to do. Yochan on the Immersa. He was a rabbi too. He had his own followers, didn't he? His own students. Sends a message to Yeshua. Are you the one? Go and, go and tell him what you're witnessing. How blessed is anybody not offended by me? You're going to see that more and more the deeper we get into end times. People are going to become more and more offended by him. It's already happening now, now. As they were leaving, Yeshua began speaking about John to the crowd. Where did he go out to the desert? What did he go out to the desert to see? Reeds swaying in the breeze? No. Then what did he go out to see? Someone who was well dressed? Well dressed people live in king's palaces. Now, why did he go out to see a prophet? Yes, I'll tell you, he's much more than a prophet. This is the one whom the Tanakh says, See, I'm sending out my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. Yes, I tell you that among those born of women, there's not risen anyone greater than Yochan and the Immersa. Let the one who is least. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. Need to break this down. Matthew 11, 1. Yeshua finished instructing the twelve. So he's gone and teaching, preaching in all the towns. Teaching and preaching different. You see a lot of Yeshua taught. Anyone who's, who's a pastor should be a teacher. Teach. You've got to teach. Did Asko to hold discourse with others in order to instruct them, to impart instruction, to explain, expound on something. That's what we're doing, right? We're having a discourse. We're explaining. We're expounding. We're instructing. This isn't, a, you know, it's not a... A 20 minute happy meal, fill in the blank sermon. It's not what we do. I'm trying to explain God's word to you. Preaching, Caruso, to announce and declare. Openly, always with the suggestion of formality, gravity, and authority, which must be listened to and obeyed. Formal. It should have gravity. It should be serious. I take this very, very seriously. It's got to have our authority about it. Listen to it and obey. Why? Because hopefully it's coming from a place of anointing from the Holy Spirit. That's why. Hopefully what you get told convicts you then you've got to deal with that, and that's going to change you. Or you might think, no, no, I don't want to deal with that conviction. What's going to happen then is your heart's going to get hardened. You don't want Holy Spirit to have access, so you're going to get hardened to it. And before you know it, you stop hearing God's voice.
John's been put in prison. He's heard what the Messiah's been doing, so he sends a message through his Talmudian students. Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for someone else? So John's been banged up now by Herod. And he's heard what Yeshua's doing, and he's wondering if he is indeed the Holy One of God. Why do you suppose he's wondering that? Because he's been banged up. Could it be that Yochanan the Immersa is having a temporary crisis of faith? Could it be he's questioning God? His faith's had a temporary lapse. He's been banged up, he's waiting to be killed, and it's crossed his mind that Yeshua hasn't delivered him. Oh God, why has this happened to me? It's understandable, isn't it? Matthew 3, it's true I'm immersing you in water so that you might turn from sin to God, but the one coming after me is more powerful than I. I'm not worthy even to carry his sandals. He'll immerse you in the Holy Spirit and in fire. So what was John's message? The kingdom of God is at hand, is near, yeah. Because the king was at hand, extending that hand in an offer of engagement, wasn't he? John's immersing people in repentance. Not in believers' baptism, as some of that have you believe. Repentance. Turn from your sin to God. But there's one coming after me more powerful than I am. John was special. Why, why do you think he baptised Yeshua? Who was his dad? Who was John's dad? Zachariah. What was Zachariah? A priest. What does that mean? Okay, was he a Levite? Nope. He wasn't a Levite, he was Aaronic. He was the one who burned the incense. The Levites did all the mopping up and all the blood work. Zachariah was a high priest from the Aaronic line. Elisheva, Elizabeth. Who was she? Zachariah's wife. She was from the Aaronic line too. Do you realise what that means? They were like royalty. From the Aaronic line. John was an Aaronic priest, the high priest. That was why he baptised Yeshua. Why do you think he called them, you brood of vipers? Why? Because they were illegit. Caiaphas was illegit. The priesthood was illegit by then. He should have been the high priest. But John didn't want all the religious dogma. He went his own way. But make no mistake, he was an ironic priest. Only lighting the way for Messiah. I'm not fit to carry his sandals. How humble is that? I'm not worthy. He's going to immerse you in the Holy Spirit and in fire. What's fire? What does that mean? What's the fire? Judgment, the fire of judgment. So John's thinking he's either coming to fill people with the Spirit or he's going to burn them. And he's thinking Yeshua's going to set up his rule and reign. That's why he's come. That's what they expected. They were hanging out for somebody to deliver them from the oppression of Rome. You can see how they were thinking. You can see how they made the mistake. 
The waiting on Messiah and Yeshua is declaring, I am the Messiah. He's going to sell up his kingdom. You, you, you'd question it too, what's going on? Wouldn't you? Put yourself in the scripture. Come on, Yeshua, take your throne. Put the Romans down. We want our king in place. People always say, why couldn't they see it? They didn't know what we know, and we still get it wrong. Why don't we see it? We still sin. Eleven four five, Matthew, go and tell Yochanan what you're hearing, what you're seeing. The blind are going to see, the lame are walking. People with leprosy being cleansed, deaf are hearing, the dead are being raised, the good news is being told to the poor. Yeshua is authenticating his identity and he's using prophetic scripture about himself. His focus here is on healing because that's what people want. They don't want to see a sign, don't they? They want the miracles. That's what people want, isn't it? How many lepers was there? Ten. How many came back? Why? Because people want the miracles. They don't necessarily want the miracle maker. That's why. They weren't born again. You can be healed and go to hell, can't you? You can be very sick and go to heaven. Isaiah, he's shown you. Isaiah 35, the eyes of the blind will be opened. The lame man will leap like a deer. It was our diseases he bore, our pains which he suffered, yet we regarded him as punished, stricken and afflicted. The deaf are going to hear, ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Your dead will live, my corpses will rise, awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For your Jew is like the morning dew, and the earth will bring the ghost to life. All scriptures about Messiah. And, and what he was going to do. If he doesn't fulfill them scriptures, he cannot be Messiah. So he said, I've come through the gate. I've come through the gate. The gate's the scriptures. The scriptures prove who he is. 333 prophetic scriptures. Divine perfection. So go tell John, I am the Messiah. Tell him who I am in his crisis of faith. As they were leaving, Yeshua began speaking about John. What did you go to see in the desert? Reed swaying in the breeze? How blessed is anyone not offended by me? Got to home in on that. Focus has got to be on your walk, not your talk. Walking like him, that's where you need to be at. Don't talk your faith, I'll show you mine by what I do. You said that. You sure was brother. People wanted a military general, not a perfect example. They wanted a military takedown of an empire. What they got was a gentle, suffering servant, not a military messiah. <coughs> Yeshua didn't rebuke John, he understood, he knew John's frailty.
we can and we probably will have temporary lapses in faith. We can all get that. But the difference between that and permanently stumbling as to the identity of Messiah is a chasm. So don't listen to the enemy. If you've got a temporary lapse of faith, that doesn't mean that you don't believe Yeshua is the Messiah. You're just struggling. So don't let the enemy or anybody else throw that in your face. But certainly guard against it. Oh, I missed the scripture here. I think I have. Wait a minute. I think I did. Oh no. Yeah. I did. I'm sorry. Page 12, we're on. Yep. Matthew 13, right? Yeshua had finished three of these parables. He went to his hometown and he taught in the synagogue. And they were astounded by him. Where, where does this man's wisdom and miracles come from? Isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother called Miriam? And his brothers, Yaakov, Yosef, Shimon, and Yehuda? And his sisters. He had at least two sisters. Aren't they all with us? Where does he get all of this? And they took offense at him. But Yeshua said to them, the only place people don't respect a prophet is in his hometown, in his own house. And he, could, he did few miracles there because of the lack of trust in his hometown. They were astounded because he's full of the spirit and they took offense at him. Prophet's got no honor. I'm, I'm no prophet by any means, but I absolutely know what that means. Because, you know, well, I'm, I'm just Arnie. <laughs> and if you knew me before, you're like, Arnie, you're kidding. You don't really have a witness with your own. I, get, I absolutely get it. So Yeshua didn't come according to their messianic expectation, did he? It says he was unable to do any miracles, just a few healings in Nazareth. Yeshua. It wasn't the faith. Some teach if, if you have enough faith, you'll be healed or you'll get this miracle. That's absolutely not true. You got, you've got to have faith. You've got to have faith. 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 It's not, it's not the gospel according to George Michael either. Sorry. It's nonsense. I, I know Rabbi Greg went to India um, with Sammy. And Hindus, Hindus came, blind Hindus. And he, and he prayed over them and they saw. I know it happened. That's not Greg, though, is it? It's not, it's not the someone who's laid hands on, it's God. Well, if you just had a bit more faith, it's on you. It's not on you. It's on God because he's the one who heals. And they were like, no, no, it's okay. We don't need you. Like the Laodiceans, remember that? No, we don't need any help. We don't want that. Forget it. Same deal. Arrogant, right? Prideful. We don't need you. 
No, just the carpet and the carpet's son. We're good. And they rejected him. So he rejected them. If you don't speak about me before men, I will not speak about you before my father. I will disown you before my father. Strong. Matthew 10.33 Holy Spirit will not force himself upon you. Especially if you're hostile and skeptical. As they were leaving, Yeshua began speaking about Yochanan to the crowd. Where, where do you go out to the desert to see? Read swaying in the breeze. They've gone to prison, they've let him know he's the Messiah. And this is what he said to the crowd as they were leaving. What did he go out to see? They knew this ironic priest had a camel hair gown. A bit peculiar. Liked eating honey and locusts. Out there in the wilderness. Strange habits. What did you expect to see? A weak holy man. Swaying in the breeze. John was anything but weak. He put it all on the line. Before being silenced. Absolutely willing to suffer for and die. For the truth. And he did. And he was... Highly, highly regarded <coughs> of all the great men of the Bible. He says this of John. Of all those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John. We'll have a look at that in a minute. We'll just keep that on the back burner. They didn't go to see a weak holy man. Was it a prophet in an Armani suit? Not hardly. Somebody well-dressed. Somebody with worldly success. John wasn't like that. He rebuked worldly pleasure. Deliberately lived humbly. And that's right. Totally dedicated to the Lord. He didn't want anything getting in the way of that. He didn't want... Anything getting in the way of God. We let things get in the way. Life just gets in the way, doesn't it? Your home, your kids, your work. We've got to deal with life. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's a lot of stuff, a lot of other stuff, white noise, junk, social media, internet, TV. stuff you've got to prioritise and get these things out of the way and do what is necessary choose what's right Martha running around cleaning, cooking Mary where was Mary? sat at his feet best place to be Sitting at Messiah's feet, right? The more time you spend, the closer you're going to get. You can't be like John, but you, you've got a lot of clutter you can get rid of. So why did you go out there? To see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, he's much more than a prophet. So much more than a prophet. What does that mean? He was more because he was the forerunner to Messiah. So the best of the prophets, other prophets prophesied the coming of Messiah. John, 
had the honour of saying, here he is. What John was saying, he can't rule over your life as king if you won't be subject to his rule and reign. It's more than he just died for your sins. He is more. More than just your saviour. He's a saviour king. And we've bought us at a very heavy price. We belong to him. He's pulled us out of the fire. And we owe him everything. Don't we? Bond servants, slaves to righteousness. Read your Bible. Wasn't just for the apostles. Bond servants, that's for us believers. It's not a bad thing. Being a slave to righteousness. Better than being a slave to sin, right? Nearly there. We're nearly there. Matthew eleven ten. This is the one about whom the Tanakh, the Torah, the Navim, the Ketuvim, the Torah, the prophets, the writings. I'm sending out my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. Malachi, not Malachi. He wasn't, he wasn't Italian. Sorry. I'm sending my messenger to clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Yes, the messenger of his covenant in whom you take such delight. Look, here he comes, says Adonai Zavon. This is John speaking about John. The messenger of the covenant in whom you take such delight. Here he comes. It's John. Matthew eleven eleven. I tell you that those born of women, there's not arisen anyone greater than John the Immerser. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So John, according to Yeshua, is the greatest of all who have lived. He was more than prepared to tell the religious leadership of the day, you are vipers, you are illegit, you phonies. He deliberately lived a poor life, no home, eating honey, locusts, convicts anybody of all the junk. No problem with it. And this what that's what Yeshua says to bring us to a close. These non born of women that are greater. Yet the one who is the least in the kingdom is greater than he. Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think about what that means? Okay. John isn't in the kingdom yet. Because Yeshua Hasn't died yet, has he? Obviously, John is in the kingdom because his face credited to him as righteousness, as was Abraham and Moses. You don't think you'll see David in heaven. What he's saying is, you're greater than him. We haven't lived like John, no way. Nowhere near. But to Yeshua, every one of you is greater than John. That's a king who deserves worshipping. Do you understand? Are you getting me? Do you understand who you are to the king and what he's done for you? Because if you don't, you need to wake up. And get with the program. This isn't fire insurance. This is real. He's your king. 
And this is eternity we're dealing with. You gotta get out of cloud cuckoo land with all your cuckoo flag waving and shofar blowing and rainbows and kittens and all the rest of the factor stuff that you, you wanna get involved in. This is real. Get yourself born again. Get yourself repented and get real with God. And if you're not there, get there today. Time to smell the coffee because time's getting short. We're born again. Born again. Greater than John. That's what he's saying. Do you understand? You understand what you mean to him. Maybe you don't. You're looking at me like I'm... No? You don't get it? Do you want me to go back? I'll explain it again. Cool. We've got a deal with the year of God's favour. Not the day of his vengeance. Stop living for yourself. Get out of yourself. Stop focusing on you and turn it out and focus on those around you. And more to the point on him. If you've got any problem, any problem, be it spiritual, emotional, physical, Yeshua is the answer to that problem. Yeshua is the answer. In him, we have something to believe in. Something to hope for, something to live for. Easy enough to take away the fear. And I'd be happy to die for that. We have a reason, a reason to live and a reason to love because love is the key. Love's the foundation. He's the foundation because he is love. We have love, we have faith, and we have hope. When he comes back, you're not going to need your faith or your hope. Because love's going to reign forever. Let's walk by faith now. And let's look forward to the day of tabernacles amongst us. And then we'll walk by sight. Fair? So, pay attention, says Yeshua. I'm coming soon. And my rewards are with me. To give each person according to what he has done. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. How blessed are those who wash the robes so that they have the right to eat from the tree of life and go through the gates into the city. The one who is testifying to these things says, yeah, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Yeshua, come. Maranatha. May the grace of the Lord Yeshua be with you all. Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom.